Um, let's start again. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Castillo. Thank you, Chris and Sophie from the Mayor's Office of Community Mental Health. Um, everything that uh, Commissioner Castillo said, plus I had dealt, I have been dealing with uh, mental health for as long as I remember in my life, but it was only a few um, short, a few um, years ago that I, I really decided to acknowledge it, to share it with those around me. And that had made a huge um, pro improvement in my mental health. Um, I just wanna make sure that um, we give you all the opportunity to have, to be able to talk to others, to be able to gain the, get the resources to understand you know, what you're going through because um, we want you to be safe, we want you to be well, but also um, we want you to continue to do the work that you do day in and day out to support you know, our fellow New Yorkers through your work and to help them. You know, like I always say, you know, arts and culture is one of the best medicines you know, for mental health. So I really want us to um, have a, a strong recovery for our sector so we have a strong recovery for our city. Um, if you are interested in more of these um, resources, please let us know through the chat. Let us know through you know, the channels in which we communicate with you. And we're always happy to continue to work with our partners in the city to uh, bring resources like this. Um, Sophie, Chris, take it away. And thank you. Well, thank you both commissioners. Uh, I haven't followed two commissioners before, so this is this is big, 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 uh, big shoes to follow. But I appreciate you both. I appreciate the work of both of your offices or agencies, uh, as both of you mentioned. You know, arts and and culture, big, big in terms of mental health, but just our society as a whole. And New York is is renowned for our arts and our culture. So appreciate all the work that your offices are doing and the people on this call, all that work that you're doing to kind of bring that into our lives again after uh, the pandemic, try to take it away, you know? And so appreciate that. Very happy to be on the call with you. My name is Christopher Lynn Logue. I'm from the Mayor's Office of Community Mental Health. I am a social worker. I am a mental health professional advocate, and I'm very happy to do the work that we do to try to bring mental health awareness and education and programming and resources to various communities throughout the city. So appreciate this opportunity. I have a, a presentation here today um, called Promoting Mental Health for Creative Workers. And so uh, hopefully we provide you with some good information and some good resources to help maintain and support your mental health as well as that of your colleagues, families, friends, whoever. All right. Uh, so our program, uh, a program that operates out of our office, Thriving Your Workplace, is a public-private partnership that works with employers and employees throughout the city on how to integrate mental health support in their workplaces. So um, we're, we're really big on workplace mental health and how our workplaces can support our mental health, especially since most of us spend a lot of time at our workplaces. So we've done a lot of great work uh, in the past two and a half years. And since the pandemic, we've been able to launch these types of trainings uh, for free, virtually. And so very pleased that we've been able to do that and happy to do it again today. So for this training, we are going to speak about mental health, um, have some common mental health language. We're going to talk about some common workplace mental health challenges. And Hopefully, we'll be able to develop your skills to support yourself and that of others. And we're going to learn some strategies to promote mental health at work, as well as we're going to view some mental health resources that are free. I should know. So before we begin, uh, let's do an icebreaker. Um, we have a quick poll for you all to um, just to check in and see where you are. All right. So the poll should have popped up in front of you. Uh, I'll read along the questions and hopefully you feel comfortable enough to respond. So the first question, please rate your level of agreement with the following statement. I am comfortable talking about mental health with my colleagues. Strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree. The second question, uh, again, please rate your level of agreement with the following statement. I know how to recognize the signs of a mental health challenge. All right. And the third question is, I know how to find information about mental health resources. All right, I see the responses coming in. Thank you, I appreciate all of your participation and all these responses coming in. All right, so um, as the responses are coming in, I think we're almost towards the end. Definitely appreciate that. All right, so let's, Share the results, thank you. So 
for the first question, I feel comfortable talking about mental health. We have a portion of the po uh, population that agrees and strongly agrees, so a majority. But we have some people who disagree, do not feel comfortable. That's okay. Hopefully, after this session today, you'll feel more comfortable. The second question, I know how to recognize the signs of a mental health challenge. Good. A lot of people feel that they can. And so hopefully this adds to that knowledge. Those of you who disagree and feel like you can't, you're going to learn some, some things to look for today. And the last question, how to identify mental health resources? Again, some people feel like they can. So we're going to add to that bank. Those of you who feel like you are not able to, at least as strongly as you would like, we'll have some for you. All right. Again, thank you all for your participation there. All right. So let's get into some knowledge. Oh, I see something in the chat. Okay. <clears throat> Depends where you work and how you discuss it. Yes, that is true. That is true. Sometimes it's easier to discuss it depending on your environment. All right. So we like to start with the mental health spectrum, right? And so <clears throat> we think of mental health as it lives on a spectrum uh, because it can we can move along the spectrum at any point in time. And so first and foremost, all of us have mental health. Just like we have physical health, we all have mental health, right? Um, just like our physical health helps us do things uh, physically, you know, walk, uh, eat, uh, assist people, lift things, so on and so forth. Our mental health also helps us do things in life. It's our state of well-being is how we cope with the normal stresses of life, how we can work productively in our families, in our, our job capacities, in our communities, all right? And so mental health, like our physical health, is something that we should always strive to maintain, right? And there are things that can be good for our mental health, right? We can have things that supplement and increase and, and improve our mental health. But then there are also things that can challenge our mental health, which gets us further along the spectrum. We talk about mental health challenges and we think of it as a broad term for the different types of situations that, that we may experience that can have a negative effect on our mental health, right? That can challenge our mental health. And so this could be day-to-day -day things like stress, you know, work, family related. Um, it could be loneliness, you know, with the pandemic and some of us having to work from home and be shut in and not necessarily engage with people in the way that we wanted to. Grief, you know, if we lost someone ever in life during a pandemic or otherwise, right? These are examples of situations that may come that can cause a challenge to our mental health, right? And then we move further along the spectrum. We're talking about mental health diagnoses, right? And these are uh, diagnosed conditions that negatively affect someone's day-to-day -day function, right? And so diagnosed by a mental health professional, clinical professional, social worker, psychiatrist, psychologist, they can diagnose these conditions, right? Those of us that are not in those, in those positions, we shouldn't diagnose people, but be aware that some people do have mental health diagnosis, all right? And so all of us have mental health, almost all of us encounter a mental health challenge at some point or another. And some people, some of us included, may be diagnosed with a mental health condition, all right? So this is the spectrum. In terms of mental health challenges, you know, they're actually pretty common, you know? The first data point, one in five New Yorkers experiences a mental disorder in a given year, right? And so, you know, 20% of the population will be diagnosed with a mental health disorder. Now, this is talking about, again, those that are diagnosed. This is not even considering people who face challenges, which are not diagnosed, right? And so a lot more people are experiencing challenges. And so just knowing that it, it helps us realize that it's much more common than we think about, right? Or even discuss. And so um, definitely something for us to pay attention to. Uh, I also like to point to the last data point, 4% of adult New Yorkers experience serious mental illness. And the reason why I point to this data point is because, you know, we're talking about uh, the, the serious mental illness is what typically gets a lot of uh, notoriety, whether that be the press or whether that be media, right, movies and entertainment, right? People always want to acknowledge those serious mental illnesses and paint the picture of them being dangerous and mental health as a whole being dangerous, when in actuality is really a smaller percentage of the population, 4% in New York, that is experiencing serious mental illness. And not all serious mental illnesses are dangerous. And it's important for us to make that distinction because we want to help reduce the stigma associated with mental health as a whole. The majority of mental health challenges and conditions fall along anxiety and depression. Those are the two most diagnosed mental health conditions, right? And the thing that most people encounter. And neither of those things are potentially as dangerous as severe mental illness, all right? And so we always wanna fight that stigma 
and always want to acknowledge that there are other people that are living and experiencing mental health challenges that are not dangerous. In the chat, um, thank you. All right. So with that information, we get to COVID-19. As uh, both commissioners mentioned, COVID-19 has had an effect on us. We all understand this. And th these, these points on this, this slide really just speak to that. Of course, there is the economic contraction that this country has gone through, um, but there's also been a cultural contraction that we can't account for, that you all are uh, acutely aware of, right? Um, the absence of culture, nightlife, restaurants, shows, movies, uh, puts a strain on us, right? Because culture and arts are, are definitely a strong way for us to maintain our mental health, right? And so those things were tapered off or non-existent, right? Some people couldn't go to a Broadway show for a long period of time as a great example, right? Um, those of us that enjoyed coming into the city and seeing things taped in front of our offices, we did not have that privilege, right? Um, and just, you know, our shows delayed or, or movies being delayed, you, you know, experiences being delayed, museums not being open in the way that they normally would be. All these things have had an effect on us as well. All right. Some other points to mention in, in regards to COVID, um, we've known about certain inequities and it just seems like COVID has amplified or highlighted equity uh, inequities in a greater way. And this kind of came to a head last summer with uh, the, the, the renewed cause for racial justice following the death of George Floyd and others. Right. We saw a, a lot of people. Um, renewing the fight for racial and social justice. Right. And, you know, COVID we know has uh, affected black and brown communities in a way that it hasn't affected others. And so definitely COVID-19 has put a great strain on a lot of our mental health. And lastly, you know, as one of the commissioners alluded to, for creative workers, this has been an extremely difficult time, right? Not being able to do what, what it is that you do, what you have a passion for, what you love to do because environments were closed. Uh, you know, there wasn't potentially the opportunity to work on a show or program in the same way that you had previously, right? Or your museum wasn't open in the way that it was previously. And so there's been a great strain on you all as well. All right. Um, so let's get into some common workplace challenges. So we start all of, all of our conversations with stress. And, you know, stress is a normal part of life. You know, it's going to happen. And it's a physiological response, as in, in our mind and in our emotions, but also a physical reaction to the demands of life, right? And so um, in some amount, stress is good. It lets us know that there is something that we need to do, right? It lets us know that we need to take some action on something. And so I, I use an example. If I'm walking through the park and a bear jumps out, I'm going to be stressed. But it lets me know that I need to perform some type of action, right? Um, if I wasn't stressed, I would just go through and boom, get eaten by the bear. Now, it, in actuality, there, it really isn't much you can do against a bear. You can't outrun it, you can't outclimb it, but at least I know that there's something for me to do, right? And that stress is the key that lets me know. Now, when we talk about stress, again, some is good, but when it's too much, it can be very detrimental and harmful and lead to mental health challenges. Right. And so too much stress, chronic stress is a is an issue. Right. So imagine that heightened sense that I might be in when I see that bear. If I'm in that heightened sense for a long period of time or consistently in that long period uh, in that state, that's not good for me. Right. So chronic stress is not good. Now, in terms of workplace stressors, there are many. Right. And this is just a list of some. And, you know, some of you may be familiar with this. There's workload and job expectations. Sometimes there's too much work. Uh, the, the timelines are too tight. We don't have enough people working on the project. You know, the expectations are too high. This can be a stressor, right? Sometimes relationships with coworkers and management can be a stressor. You know, there's conflict amongst the team or there's conflict amongst leadership and other staff that are not leadership. Uh, these situations can be stressful, right? Or if there's an absence of community, if you feel like you go to work and you do your work and then you go home and you don't have that sense of community, that can be stressful. Job security, financial changes, we are aware of that. You know, the idea that we may not be able to maintain our job or there's a reduction in hours or there isn't room for growth at our particular jobs, right? These are all things that can be stressful. Workplace environment, and this is very important now as we have been returning to the office, some of us, or to our work locations that are outside of our home, what is our environment like? Is it safe? Do we feel secure 
as it relates to COVID otherwise, or working in other types of environments. If I work in a community that is experiencing a lot of violence, you know, is that safe? Is, you know, or a community that has a lot of construction, am I worried about something falling down on me? Workplace environment. Burnout, vicarious trauma, these are specific uh, conditions. Uh, burnout related to workplace, chronic workplace stress. Vicarious trauma related to hearing stories, traumatic stories from other individuals. These can be stressful situations as well. I believe we are going to get into burnout. I'm not sure that we're going to get into vicarious trauma in depth. Now, in terms of identifying signs of stress and emotional distress, there are many ways that you can identify the signs. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just some of the things that can help you identify. So there are physiological changes, you know, physical changes, and there are behavior changes. And some of the physiological changes, for me, when I'm stressed, I may get headaches, right? Or there may be sweat involved or, or physical pains along my neck, my back, what have you. Right. So sometimes there are those physical changes that can signify that someone is stressed, but then there are behavioral changes as well. Right. And the behavioral changes might manifest uh, in, in fear, worry, you know, about your health, about others or about others state of being or yours. Right. Uh, some of the behavioral changes might be someone deviating from their typical or baseline behavior. And we'll get into that a little later. Right. Um, but of course, a, a couple other things to pay attention to changes in patterns. Right. If someone has a pattern or a routine that they typically follow or adhere to, but then you notice changes or you yourself experience changes, that could be a sign that you are experiencing some stress or emotional distress. Um, and of course, I want to get down to the last one, increased use of alcohol, tobacco or other drugs or substances. You know, this is kind of twofold. Sometimes people use these substances for recreational purposes, for the purposes of enjoyment and in moderation, that is OK. Right. As long as they are legal, it is OK. But sometimes people turn to these substances to cope with the stressors that they are dealing with. Right. And so that can lead to an increase in use of such substances. Right. And so definitely important to notice that if you or other people have seen an increase in substance use, could it be that you are trying to cope with stress of life or situations that you are encountering? Now, the second part of this is that increased use of these substances can form an addiction or dependency on those substances, which itself is a mental health condition and concern, right? If you are addicted to a particular substance, right? So definitely a big one to pay attention to and um, something that I'm aware of in the creative industry or at least in the culture industry in some aspects, these situations do come into play. We partner with uh, the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment and more specifically, the Mayor's Office of Nightlife. And this is something that we know is you know, prominent in the nightlife community, just exposure to different substances, right? And so definitely something for us to pay attention to. Now, in terms of identifying when something might be normal stress, the type that might be okay for us versus when it borders into a mental health challenge. And so um, we talk about changes from someone's baseline behavior. And when we talk about baseline behavior, we're really talking about how someone typically behaves, how they typically present, how they typically act, right? And so, you, you know, you know yourself, you know your colleagues, a typical behavior for someone in a 10 day stretch might be that they're happy, they smile, they crack a lot of jokes, they're engaging, they're outgoing, right? So you could say that that someone is a, 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 a easygoing, calm, happy, you know, social person. That's their typical baseline behavior. Now, in the next 10 days, if you notice a change, you notice that the person is not smiling, the person is not cracking jokes, the person is kind of reserved, sticking to themselves, that could be an indication that it, they are experiencing a mental health challenge because it's a change from their baseline behavior. It's not always the case, but it can indicate, right? And so that could be an opportunity for you to engage that individual in conversation. Right. And ask them, how long have they been feeling this way? No, say, I've noticed a change in you. Um, is everything OK? How long have things been going on? Do you have particular symptoms? Are they affecting your daily life? Is it affecting your ability to function? Right. Um, and, you know, they may say yes or they may say no, but at least you can engage in that conversation and help them or help them identify if there is a mental health challenge or get confirmation that there is something so that we can point to supportive services for them. All right. And we will get into the supportive services for sure. Now, as a creative worker, there are two things that we heard from uh, both of those, both of the offices that are potentially um, significant for your community, and that's anxiety and burnout. 
right? And so we're gonna get into both of these a little more. Now, in terms of anxiety, you know, um, it really is an internal response to prolonged stress. So as I mentioned previously, some stress is okay, right? But prolonged chronic stress is not good for us because it can lead to amongst many things, anxiety. Now, anxiety is really this idea. There's a, a fear or, or dread of either something existing, some external stressor, or something that has passed, or something that may or may not happen in the future, right? And so, you know, we typically may experience anxiety or anxious moments about an exam coming up, like if we're a student, right? Or a big project coming up if we're at work. And those types of anxiety are fine. You know, it, it's a course of life as part of those day-to-day -day mental health challenges, right? But when we're talking about anxiety that is severe, it's the type that can impair someone's ability to function, right? And so I'm so worried about what's coming or what may come that I'm, I, I can't do my work. I can't engage with people in the way that I want to, right? I can't maintain conversations or I can't stay focused on a task, right? And, you know, when anxiety raises to that level, it can be very severe and very debilitating, honestly, right? And so treatment may be required to help someone exist and overcome anxiety, right? Some of the ways that anxiety might manifest, you know, there are emotional aspects of it and there are also physical responses to it, right? And so there's actually an emotional aspect, there's a cognitive aspect and there's a physical aspect, right? And so the, the emotional aspect is that fear, that worry, that concern, right? The physical symptoms may be uh, something like rapid heartbeat, you know, nausea, upset stomach, headaches, muscle tension, right? These things are physical reactions to the anxiety. And the cognitive reaction might be negative thoughts that come up in your head. And you may say, I'm not good enough to do this, or I'm going to mess it up, or I'm not going to do this right, or something's bad is going to happen because, because of me, right? Those could be part of the cognitive responses to anxiety. All right. So um, we will get back to anxiety in a couple slides, but definitely wanted to provide that information as a backdrop. Now, in terms of burnout, when we talk about burnout, we like to talk about this slide, you know, this quote from Christine Maslock, who is one of the, the prime researchers in terms of burnout, right? And so she said, what started out as important, meaningful, and challenging work became unfulfilling and meaningless, right? And so when people find themselves in a situation, it could be a, a very significant sign that they are burned out. And so when we talk about burnout, we're talking about a chronic workplace we're talking about a syndrome that results from chronic workplace stress, right? At least as she has defined it and the World Health Organization has um, uh, deemed it an occupational phenomenon, right? It's workplace related. And there are many things that contribute to burnout, right? We often talk about work as uh, the main factor that contributes to burnout, just having too much work. And that is indeed a part of it. It is one of the drivers, but there are six total. Right. And so I want to talk a little bit about each of those. When we talk about lack of control, we're talking about someone's inability to control their, their work or their workflow. Right. Or the status of their work. And this can manifest with in many different ways. It can be having too many people to respond to. Right. Having too many managers or, or too many people that hold you accountable for different tasks. Right. You know, that's role um, that could be ambiguity around who, who to to respond to. Right. Then there's role ambiguity. Right. What exactly am I supposed to do? My tasks and standards say I'm supposed to do these set of things. But then people are asking me to do a different set of things. And we know that during COVID-19, that was kind of heightened because, you know, we all had to go from doing our job in one way to all of a sudden having to do our job in a different way, in a way that maybe we weren't trained in, in a way that maybe we weren't that experienced. In. And, you know, and then throw on the fact that we were doing that work that we normally would do in the office or in the field, we're doing it at home, some of us, creating ambiguity. All that is a lack of control, right? And when employees experience that over a course of time, it can lead to burnout. Insufficient rewards. And uh, this is what it sounds like, right? We're not rewarded sufficiently, whether that be financial, us not receiving the payment or the possibility for, for increase in pay, promotions um, for the work that we're doing, right? And, Sometimes that doesn't happen and that can lead to burnout. But there's also the idea of social rewards, right? And people acknowledging the work that we put in and appreciating the work that we put in, being highlighted at a team meeting or in a staff newsletter or via the employee of the month program or what have you, right? Um, being acknowledged for years of service in a profession. Those are social rewards. And sometimes when those are missing, just like the financial ones, it can lead to burnout. 
lack of community. I kind of addressed this a little bit earlier, but you know, we spend a lot of time at our workplaces, wherever they might be, right? And so we may want to have a sense of community, especially since we're working with these people and we're spending sometimes more time with them than we do with our own family members, right? And so when there's a lack of community, that can be an issue. And this can manifest in many ways. It could be a lack of trust between employees and colleagues. It could be a lack of trust with leadership or you know, managers. It can be conflict that is unresolved. Whatever it is, anything that contributes to a lack of community will eventually contribute to burnout. Absence of fairness, another one that is exactly what it sounds like, right? Uh, processes at work that are not fair or appear to not be fair. And that could be who gets assigned what tasks, who gets put on particular projects, who gets to go in the field and watch the taping of Law and Order versus who has to do the work behind the scenes. You know, who's taking notes for a meeting versus who's actually presenting and doing the glamour work, right? Lack of fairness there. It could also be around promotion status, right? Who gets promoted? How did that person get a promotion, but the other one wasn't considered? You know, it could be situations like that. It could be privileges. It can be, hey, you know, X number of people have these days off or are able to, you know, enjoy these sets of privileges and others aren't. When there's that absence of fairness in an organization or in a team, it will lead to burnout. All right. Perceived conflict of values. This one, another one that is illustrated by a, a, an example. If I'm a vegetarian and I work at a meat packing plant, that's going to be a conflict in values, potentially, because I'm a vegetarian because, hey, I don't eat meat or I don't believe in harming of meat of animals. So if I'm working at this meat packing plant, I'm harming animals or animals have been harmed and I'm packaging it so that someone can eat it. Right. And so over time, that will create a sense of burnout because I'm going against my values. Right. And of course, the last one is work overload. We know what that is. Too much work, not enough people to do it too many deadlines, so on and so forth. The reason why we like to talk about all of these factors of burnout is because there are things that organizations and teams and, and, and groups can do to prevent some of these factors from happening, right? We can make sure that we're being more consistent with our policies and how we assign tasks and we can do it in a fair way, right? We can uh, try to create that sense of community amongst our coworkers and colleagues, right? We can try to reward people. If we can't do it financially, we do it socially, right? And when we're able to do it financially, we do it financially, right? And we can eliminate some lack of control. We can have, you know, organizational charts or direct lines of communication to avoid people having to go three or four times, right? We can cut out some of that bureaucracy and red tape that prevents people from advancing their work in a way that they feel comfortable with, right? Um, so there are things that organizations can do to stem this burnout. And we'll get into some of those things a little later. So how does burnout show up, right? It can be feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion, right? No matter how much you sleep, how much you rest, you just feel like you don't have energy. In a, in a, in a situation, this could look at someone being bored or spaced out, right? Not really paying attention or, or not being able to pay attention, losing interest in something. Um, it can also be increased mental distance, negativism or cynicism, right? And this is the idea that someone just doesn't want to think about work. Right. They just have no interest in it. And it goes back to that quote we were speaking about. It used to be meaningful. I used to care about it. Now I don't care and I don't want to think about it. Right. Or the reducibility to produce a desired result, you know, not participating as strongly as one would normally in a given situation. Right. Uh, reduce efficacy, not able to, you know, uh, to work hard or to make the result that they want to see happen. Right. When you're burned out, your ability to do these things, it lessens. Right. You don't have the desire to do it and you're not capable of doing it in the same way that you were previously. So we talked about stress. We talked about anxiety a little bit. We talked about burnout a little bit. Right now, I want to talk about how these three things might. I want to talk about how these three things might present differently. Right. They seem similar, but they can present very differently. When we're talking about stress, we're really talking about um, over engagement. So I'm stressed. So I want to get active and try to handle as many things as possible. Right. Uh, overreactive emotions. You know, someone might say something and you might be extra irritated or, or extra loud or extra anxious about something and express that with emotion. Right. Anxiety and hyperactivity. Same thing. You know, hyperactive, wanting to do everything. That's how someone might respond to stressful situations. Right. In terms of anxiety. How might they respond when, if they're in an anxious state? It might be outsized reaction. So instead of an overreaction, it may be way over, right? So someone is a little bit upset, they, you know, stressed, they might respond with a little bit of anger. If they're anxious, it could be a lot of anger, 
right? A, re a reaction that is much different from everyone else in the situation. Reduce ability to function, complete daily tasks. We talked about how anxiety can prevent people from doing work because of the fear or concern or dread that they're experiencing. So they may not be over-engaged. They may not be able to do anything, right? And of course, we talked about the negative thoughts, right? They might internalize some things and have negative thoughts. And so they, they may either express them or, you know, they could express them or hold them inside, but they may not feel capable of responding because they feel negatively about themselves, right? Burnout is disengagement completely, right? Not necessarily because they're not able to do it. It's just that they don't want to do it, right? Blunted emotion. They may not react. They might feel depressed, detached, helpless, hopeless. Like no matter what they do, nothing's going to change. All right. So they, they are similar and some of the reaction could be similar, but there it's important to notice the differences in the type of ways that people are reacting. All right, let's get into some skill building. So in terms of, um, I presented some, some potentially negative news, right? And it seems that there are challenges that, that are just gonna drive us downhill, but there's good news. We're resilient and recovery is possible, right? So people that experience mental health issues or challenges, they recover and go on to live a happy, active lives. Sometimes treatment or support is needed right, in order for that to happen. But when it happens, people are able to recover and success, be successful regardless of the mental health challenge or issue that they are dealing with, right? Um, there are strategies that employers can use. There are strategies that you can use to support yourself, support your colleagues. We're going to get into that. And of course, you know, generally speaking, our resilience and our life experience gives us some tools and ability to help ourselves and others, right? We've been through some things historically as a people, as a nation, as a as a country, what have you, but also individually, you all have been through things in your life that you have overcome, right? And so it's kind of in you, some aspect is in you already to support this change and, and um, ability to deal with a mental health challenge. So in terms of mental health promotion, we like to think of these three levels. The bottom level is self-care. This is a reminiscent of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if anyone remembers the intro to psychology 101, right? Or AP psychology, if you took it in high school. Uh, so at the bottom, we have self-care. It's always important that we take care of ourselves. That is the first level of mental health promotion, all right? And we're gonna talk about some strategies to do that. Second level, as it relates to workplace and colleagues, is environment, right? We want to make sure that we have a mental health friendly environment. And there are things that we can do to establish that and work with our organizations, our offices, our teams to do that. And the last level is mental health support. Even if we're able to do these two things, at some point in time, we have to refer people to mental health professionals, right? And provide mental health support in that way. And we'll get to that. So in terms of self-care, we, we always think of uh, the mental health trifecta. Right. There's are important things that we can do to maintain ourselves. And, and one of the first ones is social support. We are a people that needs other people. I think, you know, between our two offices, the cultural affairs team and the uh, media and entertainment team, you all understand that because you work with people. You build these connections. You help create these opportunities for social support. We need that. We need that. And so as an individual, it's important for you to maintain those connections to friends, to family, to loved ones. Right. And so you know, reach out to the people in your life that you care about and that care about you, and that can help sustain your mental well-being, right? Exercise and nutrition, there is a connection between mental health and physical health. And so the things that we do physically affect us mentally, and the things that we do mentally affect us physically, right? And so in terms of exercise and nutrition, some of us can run 10 miles, some of us cannot, but all of us can do something hopefully active, right? We can walk a little bit. We can get out, make sure that we get out of the house or step out of the office, get a 10 minute, 20 minute walk in, right? Go to a local park. These, these ideas of physical activity, if it's just stretching, right? Getting the blood flowing through your body, very important. Helps release some of that negative energy, helps the blood flow positively and provides great support to your mental, right? In terms of eating and nutrition, we want to make sure that we're eating a healthy diet, what's healthy for us. We want to make sure that we're consistent with our diet, that we're providing our body with the nutrients and calories necessary to survive, right? Not to survive and to thrive, okay? And routine. Routines are great. Routines can help provide a sense of control in our life, right? And so um, it's important to establish routines, sleep patterns, eating patterns, 
other types of activities to some have some of those in a routine. That way it eliminates some uncertainty and just provides some control. I know that at this particular time, I'm going to be eating, right? So I don't have to worry about that, stress about that, think about that. I know that I need to get to bed at 10, 10 p.m. because I'm waking up at 530 every morning, right? So I set that routine, make sure I get that, that rest that my body needs and I stay on schedule. Right. And routines are also important, as we alluded to earlier, because if there's a change to a routine, it can signify that someone is dealing with a mental health challenge. All right. So. so another strategy for self-care is the practice of mindfulness. Now, mindfulness is being aware of your current experience and the actions you perform. Right. It's being present in the moment and not necessarily thinking about the past or thinking about the future. Right. It's experiencing something without judgment. It's just experiencing something. It's not good, it's not bad. And this idea of mindfulness is useful. It has shown and been shown to improve mood and positive emotion. It can decrease symptoms of anxiety and burnout, right? Two things that we spoke about today. And it has improved physical health outcomes. So people that practice mindfulness, they are able to experience, you know, some positive health outcomes as well. So there are a couple of strategies that we like to point to in terms of practicing mindfulness. The first one, we call acknowledge, control, and accept, right? So we're going to acknowledge what, situa what the situation is. We're going to recognize, observe it. We're going to let it go, right? We're going to focus on what we can control and not worry about the things that we can't. We can oftentimes um, control our response to something, not necessarily the outcome, right? So that's what we want to try to focus our energy on, what we can control. And then we want to accept some things we have to accept and experience. We want to accept it without a judgment, right? Um, some things we have to accept in life, right? We want to accept it. And another strategy is RAIN to help manage anxiety and stress. Same, similar type of principle, recognize what's going on, allow the experience to be there just as it is, no judgment. We're going to investigate our feelings about it with kindness, right? We're not going to be harsh or too critical of ourselves for feeling how we feel about something, right? And we're going to nurture ourselves with self-compassion, right? We're going to make sure that we, again, are kind to ourselves and being compassionate towards ourselves. We have a, a beautiful webinar that speaks about mindfulness approaches and the use of mindfulness to help deal with anxiety or uncertainty. You can definitely check it out. Now, I want to talk about level two and, you know, environment and things that our employees and our, our groups, our workplaces can do to kind of create workplace programs to foster this social connection, which is very helpful for maintaining mental health and well-being. The first one is employee champions. So when we talk about employee champions, these are the members of your office, your team, your organization that know about mental health, um, are happy to advocate about mental health, are happy to speak about mental health, join committees, work with other people to advance mental health, to advance initiatives, right? We can use these individuals. These individuals can help plan these events. They can recruit people to attend events. They can create opportunities for people to come and explore mental health or mental health resources, right? So if there are these individuals at your groups and your organizations, we definitely want to encourage them to be a part of everything. All right. Now, employee resource groups. This is a great, great, great idea. Employee resource groups are groups of employees that come together based on a shared identity, right? And as they come together, they can create community amongst each other and they can share resources with each other, right? So this is a great way for employees who have the same identity. So parents, if you have a bunch of parents that, you know, are employed, they can come together and form a parent resource group. And so anyone that works at DCLA or works at MOM or works at some creative entity, can, if they're a parent, they can come together and talk to each other about what it's like to be parents and work here, right? Hey, I had a situation with my youngster. This is what we're going through. And another parent can say, I went through that. Here's some resources for that, right? Now, the beautiful thing about employee resource groups is they can be formed on many different types of identities and they have, right? Some groups are formed on the identities, race, uh, on gender identities, on sexual orientation identities, on religious identities, any type of identity. If there are multiple people that are identified, they can be part of an uh, employee resource group. Now, this is something that can be done in person, obviously, you know, there's a time in the day when people can come together and meet. It can be done virtually. It can be done offline where there's a group chat via some messaging app where everyone that is a parent or everyone that is black or everyone that is, you know, identifies as a member of the LGBTQI community, however the group is, they can communicate in that way. All right. So definitely something for everyone to pay attention to. And last is peer navigators. You may have individuals that you work with who have some lived experience of a mental health challenge or diagnosis, right? And because of that, 
they could serve as a peer navigator for others, right? Sometimes instead of wanting to go to HR or talk to the EAP or a social worker, I'm much more comfortable going to a peer who may have had a similar experience, right? Um, the important thing to know about peer navigators, even if that individual has been living with that mental health challenge or illness, it doesn't mean that they necessarily want to be the peer navigator, right? So we have to make sure we engage that individual and say, hey, Chris, I know that you have dealt with anxiety and you are currently living with it. Would you mind being a peer navigator for other people who may be experiencing that? If they say yes, then cool. You don't just want to send someone to Chris because they're out of left field. It's like, hey, how's my business out in the street, right? Not a good look. Managers have an important role in creating this environment. You know, managers should be leading with compassion and modeling supportive behaviors. We have a webinar that talks about supportive management practices and ways that managers can lead with compassion, right? They are responsible for fostering that environment, you know, because they uh, live in two worlds, right? They are dealing with the people that they manage, but they also have the ear of leadership, right? And so they're in a unique position to help create that mental health friendly environment, right? Managers can promote trust and accountability in a way that is productive, right? So not trying to blame people, that's not necessarily accountability, right? Trying to be supportive and working with someone to ensure that they can get the task done. That's how we can support and promote accountability, right? Same thing with trust. And of course, managers can be part of that opportunity for social support. They can be, you know, can allow their colleagues or the people that they're supervising to be part of employee resource group or to plan an activity for the office, right? And of course, managers have to know about resources and share them widely. So some ways that we want to talk about mental health, um, we always want to be inclusive, right? And we want to be supportive. And so we want to inquire about how the person is feeling and listen actively. We want to use supportive language, maintain a positive outlook. And of course, we want to be able to share resources. Uh, remember that you are not a therapist. It's not your job to diagnose or label someone, right? Those are mental health professionals that do that, right? Our job is just to listen and be supportive. In terms of communication, some practices here, we wanna ask open-ended questions, relate by sharing individual challenges if we can, and it makes sense. We wanna acknowledge differences between colleagues and understand that they may need different things, right? So colleagues that are black, they need, you know, different things might affect them. Colleagues that are women, different things may affect them, right? And so it's important for us to acknowledge that, know about that, and check in with people as we think it might affect them, right? And be respectful of that. Practice reflexive listening. We wanna make sure that we're hearing what the actual challenge that someone is dealing with, right? So we might validate, we might ask clarifying questions. This is a slide that talks about things that we don't want to say, that sometimes we do say, right? The idea here is really, Think about intention, uh, impact versus intention. You may mean well, but it may land differently, all right? And so some of these things we say is in our attempt to try to be positive and supportive, but they may not be viewed as positive or supportive, right? The idea of someone saying, just try to stay positive, perhaps the person may be trying to stay positive for you. So you saying something like that, you may mean well, but it may not land well, all right? Instead, we want to use things like, thank you for sharing. I appreciate you sharing that with me. I acknowledge that that must be extremely tough. Is there a way that I can support you, All right? I'm moving kind of quick because we're getting close on time. But I did promise that we would talk about mental health resources, all right? So there are two, set, two types of resources that can be found or that I'm gonna speak about today. There are organizational resources. So I alluded to Thriving Your Workplace and our work. So on our webpage, there are resources for organizations, and I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. There are also individual resources that you can use, that colleagues can use, loved ones can use, anyone can use. I'm going to go through some of those today as well. So this QR code will take you to our web page, the Thriving Your Workplace web page. And on that web page are all types of organizational support, organizational resources for, so how an organization can help create a more mental health friendly workplace, right? So we have a toolkit for employers that's full of recommendations and resources on how to implement those recommendations. We have over 15 webinars that you can view for free on various workplace mental health topics, right? We have one, as I said, for managers, supportive management practices. We have a DEI webinar. We have um, vicarious, creating a vicarious trauma-informed workplace webinar. We have one on burnout, a, an extensive conversation on burnout, right? We have that one on mindfulness and, and dealing with anxiety and uncertainty. Lots of great, great webinars that can be viewed anytime by anyone for free, all right? Organizational resources. And of course, if any organization wants to figure out what they can do for their workplace and needs guidance, definitely reach out to us 
we can work with you and take you, you know, in a one-to-one -one con uh, consultative manner and support your workplace. Now, in terms of individual resources. So here are some tips on how we might connect someone to mental health support. Obviously, we want to speak to them in private. We wouldn't want to speak to them out in the open in front of everyone else, especially other colleagues, right? We just want to let them know that we're concerned. We've noticed a change in their behavior, right? Um, we want to let them know that we care about them and explain that mental health support is confidential and effective. If you are going through a challenge, if you're experiencing something that you're having trouble dealing with, mental health support can help you get through it and continue on a successful life, right? Um, if you know about particular referrals, definitely share them, right? If you know anything about the referrals, is like the cost or, or things associated, if you have that information, share it. If you don't know, you know, you, if, you're, if you have an employee assistance program, you can make reference to that. Hey, you know, we have a great EAP. They offer some free counseling sessions. Definitely something for you to check into. You should check with your organization to see if you have an EAP. If you are a city employee, you definitely have one. The city has a great, great EAP program. Check into it. Or you can call NYC Well, which is a 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week uh, mental health support hotline, right? And this could be for an immediate crisis. It could be for someone that just wants to talk about something that's going on, or it can be to identify additional resources, like finding a provider or a particular type of service, all right? We always want to assure the person that we care about them and that we're going to be with them every step of the way. So we did create our office, a guide for performing artists. And you know, I know everyone on this call may not necessarily be a performing artist, but you are in the creative realm. And so some of these resources are going to be available to you, even if you're not a performing artist, all right? And so if you follow this QR code, it will take you directly to this guide. And it lists different types of resources, different types of funds, organizations that are trying to support creative workers, performing artists, and so on and so forth. So a great resource that our office was able to put together, QR code, I will share this presentation afterwards so you'll have access to this. Another great resource, we did work with the Office of Nightlife on the Elevate initiative and to try to provide resources for members of the nightlife industry, anyone that works in the nightlife profession, um, bars, restaurants, you know, clubs, uh, films that get shot at night, all types of things, right? And so again, this QR code will take you to that uh, to that guy and talk about those resources that are there. I do want to highlight that there is a weekly support group for members of the nightlife industry. It happens every Monday at 4 p.m., all right? And so definitely check that out. And even if you feel like you may not be in the nightlife industry, look into it because you there could be a way that you could finesse yourself into that support group, all right? And it's a very, very, very great support group partnering with Backline. And, uh, an organization that supports nightlife industry, musicians, performing artists, so on and so forth. So definitely check that out. Now, in terms of NYC Well, as I mentioned, this is a 24 hour a day, seven day a week um, supportive service. Uh, you connect with a trained counselor. So whether you text in, call in, chat in, you connect with a trained counselor on the other end. Services are available in over 200 languages. So I doubt that there's a language that I doubt that you won't be able to find services unless you speak that 201 language, whichever one that may be. But uh, the trained professional on the other side can provide immediate support for you or for whoever calls in. You can call for yourself, you can call for a colleague, however you wanna do it, you call for a family member, that person can provide immediate support and help you identify other forms of support, long-term care, long-term providers, you know, just additional support in your area, right? On the NYC Well website, they have two great resources. One is the app library, where you can take a look at mental health related apps that they have vetted. And so um, things that you can download to your phone to help with anxiety, depression, different types of mental health challenges and concerns. So on their website, you can filter by concern and see the different types of apps. The second thing that they have on their website is called the find services feature. And so it's a search for mental health services. So you can type in anxiety and you can see all of the agencies in the city, all the entities in the city that provide support for anxiety. You can filter by age, you can filter by borough. So if I wanted to see four adults in Brooklyn, it will narrow the list and show all the entities in Brooklyn that deal with anxiety for adults, right? Um, so definitely a great feature, definitely check it out. Don't think we'll have time to walk through it today, but wanted to let you know, great, 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 great service NYC Well. And lastly, I wanna talk about the How to Help Guide, which is a guide that our office was able to develop in partnership with DOH and will help in hospitals. The guide 
walks you through how to support anyone that is looking for mental health care. All right. And so it is um, kind of like a pick your adventure situation more. You know, you, you, you see there are different links and it says, hey, I'm looking for a provider. If that's what you're doing, boom, you hit that link and it'll take you directly to that resource. If you say I'm looking someone's in crisis, I don't know what to do. It'll take you to that resource. And so there's a, a bank of uh, situations and you click whichever situation applies to you or the person that you're seeking support for, and it will take you to that resource. So very comprehensive guide, very easy to use and very, very helpful. So definitely check that out on our website. And of course, follow us for different updates, mental health related. I did, I did have a website walkthrough, but we're kind of pressed for time. So I'm not sure that we're gonna do that. Uh, I will stay on and be available for any questions that people may have. I know we're kind of time bound, but I'll stay on as long as anyone would like to stay on to answer questions. And we can uh, probably stop recording at this point too, in case anyone wants to share anything that is personal.